1985, economist Rajneesh Mehra and Edward Prescott studied the U.S. S&P 500 historical data over the last century and noticed something unusual. They've tried using all kinds of economic models to explain the anomaly, but nothing really came to light. Without a logical explanation at the time, the duo coined this mystery as equity premium puzzle. Ever since its discovery, the equity premium puzzle remains one of the most well-known unresolved mysteries in finance. Despite an extensive research effort in academia for decades, economists still cannot find a generally accepted solution that explains the mystery to this day. Typically, there are two kinds of investments that investors consider. One is the stock market, which is equity investments. The other one is treasury bills, which are bonds that are backed by the government. The difference between return on a stock and return on a bond would be referred to as equity premium. Through their study, Mera and Prescott noticed that the U.S. stock returns had been much higher than the returns for treasury bills. The average rate of return on the U.S. stock market for the past 110 years has been about 7.9%, while the return on bonds was only 1%. They found that the difference between the two assets was statistically significant. Besides the U.S., stock markets in Western Europe and East Asia have also showed a similar difference. Seems like this is a universal phenomenon. Anyone who understands a little finance would know that riskier investments generate greater returns. Stocks are risky investments because the return depends on how well the market is doing, and that indicates a possibility of getting a higher return. On the other hand, treasury bills have almost no risk because the government is guaranteed to pay you back if you buy their bonds. Taking all of these into consideration, it seems to make perfect economic sense that stocks have a higher rate of return than treasury bills. Then why is it considered to be a puzzle? Even though stock investments were riskier in nature, Mayra and Prescott argued that the premium was still very high. By using the traditional economic models, they calculated that the reasonable return premium over bills should hover at around 1%. This calculation didn't match with the data at all. In fact, the difference of 6 to 8% seems to be completely out of this world. This premium over the last century is simply an extraordinary huge outperformance. On the surface, this puzzle looks like an interesting observation only, but Mayra urged economists that they shouldn't treat this as a fun riddle. It shows us that our existing economic theories are clearly missing something. Perhaps our understanding of the market isn't as deep as we thought, or worse, maybe we've been getting certain things wrong this whole time. Because of this reason, many economists had tried to solve the puzzle for decades, but almost all of them failed. Three years after the discovery of this puzzle, economist Thomas Reitz suggested that a rare economic disaster could resolve the mystery. A rare economic disaster happens when there's a substantial drop in GDP and the overall consumption level drops at least 25%. The reasoning behind the hypothesis is simple. If people were expecting a disaster about to happen in the future, they would like to see a higher return from stocks in order to justify their investments. Otherwise, no one would put their money into the stock market if the world is ending soon. Though the hypothesis sounds plausible in theory, Mayra rejected Wright's claims. He argued that this type of economic disastrous event would be too rare to happen. Also, such an event has never been observed once in the US for the last century. Neither of the two world wars nor the Great Depression experienced such drastic decline in consumption level. Wright's model was simply far too extreme to resolve the puzzle. In 1995, economist Stephen Brown and colleagues attempted to solve the puzzle with the idea of survivorship bias. They argued that the data we observed only reflected the transactions that survived the volatile financial crises. Many other transactions have been unsuccessful. If we had included the failed transactions, the premium would be lower. We were simply looking in the wrong places. Mayra rejected this theory also. He argued that treasury bills were as likely as stocks to lose value during the volatile financial crises. For instance, when the national government fell in China in the late 40s, the Shanghai Stock Exchange went bust. The government also abandoned the bonds. Since volatile markets have an impact on both assets, the equity premium isn't affected. Mayra then concluded that the survivorship bias cannot be the solution. Around the same year, economists Shlomo Benarzi and Richard Taylor proposed the idea of myopic loss aversion. Loss aversion is a behavior bias where we are so afraid of losses that we focus on trying to avoid a loss more so than taking on a gain. A good example would be the famous Samuelson's colleague problem in the 80s. Paul Samuelson, an economist, asked his colleague if he would accept a gamble on a toss of a coin. He could lose $100 or win $200. His colleague responded, 
I won't bet because I would feel the $100 loss more than the $200 gain. I'll take you on your promise if you allow me to make 100 such bets. Myopic means short-sightedness. Both Benarzi and Taylor argued that, as investors, we like to check on our stock portfolios all the time. As we know, the stock market goes up and down in value every day. The more we check our portfolios, the more likely we see a loss, and the more we experience loss aversion. When we see a loss, we panic. Since we don't want to lose money, we need to know that the stock market has a really high return potential to make the investments worth it. This could be why we see an unusually high rate of return on stocks. Of all the presented explanations, the myopic loss aversion sounds like the best plausible explanation to the puzzle. Multiple studies seem to be able to provide experimental evidence to support the theory as well. However, the reaction to the evidence is mixed. Some researchers called out the fact that the experiments were done in lab settings, where actual investors might have other biases in play in real life. Some revisited the evidence and concluded that the model Benarzi and Taylor proposed was not robust. Some argued that some professional traders in real life were prone to overconfidence and might affect how financial information is distributed. Seems like the economists still can't reach a consensus on the explanation. Although it's disappointing to know that there isn't a full-fledged and convincing explanation to this mystery, the equity premium puzzle remains one of the most fascinating topics in finance. As economists and researchers continue to search for answers, the puzzle will open up new avenues for future research and possibly new discoveries.